Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kathleen McLean. I work in programming here at the Art Gallery of Ontario. I'm pleased to see so many of you here tonight for our talk with Liz Magor. Just the order of things. The talk here is from 5.30 to 6.30. We'll have some time for questions following the end of the talk. At 6.30, you're all invited to come upstairs to Walker Court, where we will celebrate the exhibition and have a very special announcement of the Gershon Iskovitz Award winner for 2015. So I hope you can all join us in Walker following the talk. At this point in time, I'd like to invite Kitty Scott, our curator of modern and contemporary art, to introduce Liz Magor. Um, thank you, Kathleen. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's so nice to see so many familiar faces uh, in the audience. So thank you for all coming on this, uh, maybe the worst day of October, perhaps. <laughs> maybe the first day of winter. I'm not sure what's going on out there, but uh, it's very unpleasant. Anyway, uh, so coming out, I, I can see it took all that much more effort. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, I just want to ask somebody in the audience to shout out the name of who we're celebrating tonight. Okay, let's hear a big cheer for her. <laughs> so Liz, Liz is one of my favorite artists. I'm not going to hide that. Um, and uh, it's really gives me a great pleasure to be up here this evening introducing, introducing this talk. Um, so, uh, we are celebrating Liz Mager and her exhibition, Surrender, uh, curated by Adelina Vlas, who's currently on maternity leave, just to let you know, but she will be present uh, for, the, uh, for the remarks in Walker Court, uh, which is on view at the AGO until November 29th. Um, Liz uh, could be described as a kind of poly-Canadian. It seems that she was born everywhere and lived everywhere but all, and worked everywhere, but I'm going to go through all that in detail so you know. Uh, Liz was born in Winnipeg, uh, however her family moved to Vancouver when she was very young. She studied at the University of British Columbia, uh, Parsons School of Design, which you all know is in Nova Scotia, and the Vancouver School of Art. In the 1980s, Magor moved to Toronto and by 1988 she'd exhibited at the Biennale of Sydney, Sydney Biennial, the Venice Biennial, and Documenta. So you, you can't really do much better than that in contemporary art. So she's, she's hit all the high points, the high notes. She did that uh, at a really good age. So I think a really, really strong artist, somebody who knew what she was doing quite early on in the game. It takes some time for people to notice sometimes, but uh, she's really a national treasure. So let's just hear one more cheer for her. <laughs> So, Mager is the winner of the Audane Prize, the Governor General's Award, and of course, the 2014 Gershon Iskowitz Prize. She's exhibited nationally and internationally. Uh, she lives and works in Vancouver. Liz's work investigates both natural and domestic spheres, and her sculptural works speak to forms of refuge, hoarding, and hiding, confounding the boundary between reality and the simulation through an exploration of materials and the painstaking deployment of various casting techniques. In this exhibition, everyday objects and forms, as well as the natural world, function allegorically by evoking the human need to surrender to desires, compulsions, and fantasies. Um, before welcoming Liz, I also just want to celebrate uh, a new catalog that has come out. It has a fantastic yellow cover, which I think if anyone's been to Vancouver, you know those big piles of sulfur that you see in the harbor? I, I think of that when I look at this. I'm not sure if that's what's going on, but that, I think that ignites and creates a flame. But the title, of course, doesn't mention yellow, so it's the blue one comes in black, Liz Migor. Um, this publication came together through a collaboration of all kinds of institutions. I think there's a little bit of Catriona, a little bit of Susan Hobbs, a little bit of Catriona Jeffries, a little bit of Credex, uh, with the curator, at, at Triangle Gallery in France, Celine Kopp, a little bit of the Contemporary Art Gallery in Vancouver, uh, a little bit of the Esquitz Prize. So uh, really great to see a new publication. Um, for any of those, for those of you who want it, I suggest you order it. Um, beautiful new catalog on Liz Magor. So congratulations, let's come up on stage and let us hear what you have to say. Give me all your love, I, I, I'll eat it up. <laughs> no problem, you're sending it to the right place. 
Um, I can't see you from here exactly, but I know I know a lot of you, so it's uh, very, very exciting to be in Toronto in, in this way. When I normally come to visit, I see one or two people at a time. Never been in a big crowd, not since I lived here. Um, I lived here all through the 80s and part of the 90s, so I, and I taught at OCAD during those years, just um, one day a week, but gradually I met lots and lots of people who are still artists. And in part, um, because I have the exhibition just down the hall, and because I lived in Toronto for so long, and also because um, I'm here because of Gershon Iskowitz, Iskowitz um, I, I wanted to sort of skew the talk in a, in a direction that uh, I haven't done before. So I put together some images that um, will just prompt me to talk about um, the progress of being an artist. Uh, Gershon uh, arrived in Canada the year before I was born, so we kind of entered the country around the same time. And he must have seen something in this country that made him decide to um, support artists after, after he had left. Um, and the foresight of that and whatever he noticed and whatever he um, um, thought he could do about it was was prescient. I mean, it was a it was an intuitive and um, um, a precise thing to do. And the effect on my life, the, the award is so generous, the prize is so generous, and um, the fact that it comes from another artist. Um, there's something different about that, and. So um, it humbled me to hear um, the jury phone me one day when I was in the depths of a horrible public commission that just about killed me. I, I um, will never do that again. Um, so the jury phoned me and um, said that I was the recipient, would I accept? And of course I said yes. But it humbled me um, because it came from an artist originally. And in a way, um, for the past year, I've I've... I've wanted to be worthy of this prize. And um, so I've thought a lot about the fact that I'll be speaking tonight, um, but can make no headway into it. Um, it's a complex subject, not just to talk about being an artist, but, but to be an artist over decades. I'm in the middle of my fifth decade of, of working, and so all of those 10-year parcels are kind of different. Um, and there's no narrative to 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 to, to um, sort of base a talk on. I could I could um, concoct one. I could say then I did this, then I did this, then I thought this, and then I thought this, and <laughs> this happened. Uh, but it wasn't like that. There's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, days when you don't know what you're doing. There's a lot of years that you don't know what you're doing. So I put together some, some images to kind of talk from that point of view. Obviously, if I have worked for nearly 50 years, there's a reason for that. And so in a way, I'm trying to push my way into that tonight. If it doesn't go well, if the talk is really, really uh, ridiculously rambly, I'll just stop and we'll do questions. We'll do questions anyhow. I have to watch the time here. Um, so to, to kind of get me on the right path. I remember two works that I made. I'll show them both to you right away and then just talk about them for a bit. Um, I made these shortly after I arrived in Toronto. I came here when I was 32, so maybe I was 33, 34 when I made these two works. And I made them because I was very, very stuck. I was stuck. Financially, I was pretty stuck. I was teaching one day a week. That was my only source of income. But also, Toronto was um, sort of bracing. It was a very, the 80s were a very um, contentious, argumentative decade in art, and artists were arguing about value a lot. It wasn't, it was before the market swept everything away into an obvious um, destination for art. It wasn't so obvious in the 80s um, as to what art was for and how it could operate. So I remember Toronto being full of, um, argument. And I thought, um, since I, Kitty gave you my, my uh, education record, which is just names of places, but you could see that I didn't stay any place for very long. I went to three post-secondary institutions and quit them all, so I was poorly educated, but I was deeply searching. 
And I came to Toronto because I had to, I had to kind of escape Vancouver and the impending um, photo conceptualists because I thought there's no place for me. If I stay in Vancouver, I'll become a cranky, quirky would be the name. People would say, oh, she's a quirky artist. And so I knew I had to come and learn more. And I came and I learned a lot in Toronto. And in about 1984, I thought, you know, art is hard. It's much harder than I thought. The first 10 years of being an artist were kind of fun, kind of easy. Then I started to get into the thick stuff um, because you have a lot of freedom in Canada. There might not be support, but you can do it, almost anything you want. Um, so you have to decide what the program will be, what, what you will spend this, this one life doing. Um, and I got kind of stuck at, at the, uh, the import of that. I, I thought maybe I wasn't up to it. So I made these two images. One was a portrait of me um, in terms of my body, let's say. That's not that one. This one. Can you see the book? It says Pregnancy After 35. And it's, um, it's a little pocket book that was for sale in those days. And there's two lead eggs, um, made of lead, like they're hen's eggs that have been cast in lead. And there's an image of a woman rushing to work, and she's punching in just before the clock um, times her out. It's a Norman Rockwell drawing. Um, so in my mid-30s, I, I could see this fork in the road. I would have to make a decision. Um, at the same time, I was I was thinking this way, I was thinking um, this is a time for, for people who weren't able to make art before, uh, particularly I'm speaking of women, this is a time women can make work because we can make decisions that um, generations before us weren't able to make. Um, so those decisions um, are important. Um, this is a sort of a, a copy, a bad copy of uh, a Brancusi work that he called Sleeping Muse. So I imagined the muse for him who would be a woman, who would be a normal woman, who was his model, and she might um, be posing for him. And while she's posing in this kind of sleeping position, she's actually dreaming of the work that she wants to make. Um, she wants to be an artist. She wants to be a sleeping artist that will wake up. Um, so I saw the fork in the road. I saw the opportunity, and I decided to take one of those forks. And... Um, so I decided not to have children, is what I'm saying. And it was a deliberate decision. I decided this will be a journey I will um, do by myself. And it seemed brutal, a bit brutal. But I thought it was not as brutal as Agnes Martin. One time I saw her in Vancouver, she was giving a talk, um, probably in the 70s. And if I were to describe her appearance as a Halloween costume, I would say she was dressed like a potato. And she was, so she wasn't giving us very much. And she said, and she was giving us her declarations as to what artists needed to do to be real artists, good artists. And she said, um, artists should be alone. They should be alone all the time. They should have no companions, not even pets. And I said, <laughs> not even dogs? And she said, not even dogs. <laughs> and I thought, I'm screwed because I have had two dogs. Um, <laughs> um, oh, I'd love to say more about Agnes Martin, but I won't. So, so I took this uh, fork in the road. Um, I decided to um, try to find out what I valued and, and respond to it. Um, it wasn't kind of that deliberate because I had been bothered by things forever. Um, and so I thought the, the way I'll the work will be what, what I've been bothered by. And um, so this is the part where I imagine this talk and I can't, in my imagination, I couldn't go any farther than this. So this is the part of this talk that might just go to ratchet right here. <laughs> right. Um, let me try this. Um, what bothered me always um, was that the world was so far away from me. Um, even if it was even if I was lying in my bed and the pillow was here and the blanket was here, I thought, the, the pillow's here and the blanket's here. I want them closer than here and here. I want this world that I live in, I want to know it in a different way than to just be uh, using it or to just be looking at it. Or I wanted somehow to absorb it or to know it. 
And it was frustrating. And by the world, I mean, I wanted to know the world, and that would include everything. I mean, that would include, um, I lived in Prince Rupert, that would include all the rain that fell in Prince Rupert, or the fog that was there, or Ed Sullivan on TV, or mom and dad, or my brothers, or the sort of beat up dog that we had, or the toys that we played with. Um, I didn't want to just have them, I wanted more than that. Um, and I didn't see how I could get past the barrier of me and all my thinking and them and all their not thinking. These things are not thinking about me, but I'm so thinking about them. And I wanted them to think about me, actually. <laughs> I wanted all those inanimate things to think about me um, so that I could converse with them in some way. So um, a lot of the work that I'm showing here or that I've made over these years are different ways to try to get into that place where the barrier between me as a, as, as a looking person, as a person looking, and that world that I know is not so separate from me but um, is persistent in, in how it um, avoids my grasp. Um, a lot of the work are different approaches to, to trying to penetrate that barrier. I found out pretty quickly that if I make my own work, um, I can slow it down. Um, slow is good. If something do doesn't exist and I make it, well, it's really super slow. I mean, it starts as a thought or a feeling or a desire, and then it starts to get made. So that's super slow. That's really good. Um, so that became and remains... Um, I don't know, a, a major part of how I proceed. I don't, I don't conceptualize first. I start um, uh, trying to scrape scraps into images and then I try to figure out what those images are about. Um, it might be that when I say all the things in the world, it might be that uh, people are things in the world, but I found them, I found humans to be way too um, twitchy, let's say, or way too fast and I would like them, well dead humans would be good because they're, they're so slow. Um, or a boyfriend in a coma, I've always wanted a boyfriend in a coma. <laughs> but no one will accommodate me. Um, this is a work called Regal Decor. Um, it's, a, it's like a giant magazine, I can't, I don't, I think it's about this high. And it's a photograph that's mounted to a magazine shape, and I've collaged this image of a woman in, in lying in bed um, in some kind of anxious state or a worried state. And she's in this domestic interior that's quite desirable, quite upper class, middle class, quite lovely, it's full of art. Um, but she's not, either she's the victim of it or she's trying to produce it. I don't really have a clear idea of her relationship except to say it's not satisfactory. Um, there she is close up. Um, along similar lines, maybe around the same time, um, date-wise I'm totally screwed. I haven't got any, any idea, like I'll get the decade completely wrong. So I won't even try to tell you I will always say, Hobbes, when was this? Hobbes, when did I do this? Um, this is at Hobbes. This is called uh, One Bedroom Apartment. And so in a way, the dog is equivalent to that woman. Um, and the dog has a, a kind of a similar uneasy relationship to all the stuff around him. I've reinstalled uh, that wor work uh, here at the AGO. Um, with more stuff. This work uh, I've done many times in many different cities all over the world and I just take the dog, the dog is the component that... Um, is Michael Buchanan here? Michael? No. Michael helped me make it. Um, and then I ask the people in that city to find the stuff that would make up a one-bedroom apartment and then we you know, fill the boxes. It's kind of fun. It's kind of like moving in or maybe moving out. Um, and the idea is to have lots of, of things that have served. They serve in, in some respect as um, accoutrement or um, accessories to the, to the person, to the homeowner or the um, tenant. 
Um, but on the other hand, when it comes to moving, um, those objects that have kind of served you, they become rebellious and heavy and stupid and broken and out of date and dirty. And um, so this relationship, this desire to be close to the world that mostly is satisfied by acquiring things um, um, proves to be a very expensive spiritually as well as financially a very expensive relationship because of the maintenance of all this crap that ends up uh, losing its allure practically immediately. Um, so all the packing and the, uh, the um, protection of these very banal, I don't ask for really special things. Um, the curator and the, the people at the gallery can bring practically anything and I say, yeah, that's just like a normal house where everything resides. Um, so all this stuff demands, um, suddenly it asks for repayment for, um, for any pleasure it ever gave us. Now it suddenly wants something else. And uh, so if, if I ever have a sense of you know, being in command of the household and moving the sofa and putting the books up, I, I realize that all these things are actually um, the theater directors of my um, shabby life, um, where I try to keep entropy at bay, try to keep dust out, keep all that um, slow, slow deterioration that's um, like a, such a major humiliation in the domestic, in the domestic sphere. Uh, so other images in over the, those 45 years, um, many images are similarly domestic, uh, uh, domestic images, um, they've maybe been over-interpreted as, uh, oh, about nature. Oh, no, it's so not about nature. My work is so not about nature. Um, or they've been misinterpreted as, you know, fascination with the recluse. Um, what I think about reclusivity is, I think of Marcel Proust who said the recluse is really, is thought to be somebody who doesn't like other people, but the recluse really cares too much about other people and can't bear the, um, the, uh, the existence of other people and their thoughts and their opinions. And uh, so I think that these images, these recurring images of of isolated rooms or houses that uh, occur in my work are actually, uh, <laughs> this is so stupid, um, uh, are images of, of desire to, to be connected in a funny way, um, not a desire to go in the opposite direction. This is a tiny little cabin, maybe nine inches by 11 inches. Um, this is a place um, that's probably a condominium now. I haven't been up there. I was in a group called Grace Hopper, of which I see two people, three people. I see Sandra Meggs, I see John Massey. Fastworms was in Grace Hopper. Whose hand is, oh, Rebecca. Rebecca was in Grace Hopper. Kim Adams was in Grace Hopper. Michael Fernandez, Sheila Alexander. Please, God, don't let me forget one of the artists who. Sandra, did I forget? Who? I said Kim Adams. And we went up to this um, big old GE place up there. What is that? Davenport and another D word. DuPont. DuPont, yeah, yeah. And so it had this interior exterior. It had this room with, with windows looking into the room. So I put the little cabin in there. Um, it's true that... Um, the idea of being alone is very sweet, but it's also true that being alone is very bitter. And um, uh, so, <laughs> oh, shut, shut up. Uh, <laughs> um, stuff, right, stuff, piles and piles of stuff. Um, so I, I th more and more, um, found a way to, to be with things by making them. And um, mold making became this wonderful, like a photographer, I feel like a photographer, became a wonderful way to hold images for a long time and, and think about them and actually kind of, I love opening the mold when, you know, these molds are made of real things. So for, a, uh, for an image like this, 
I get a tray, I put another tray on top of that, I get the candy wrappers, I get the cigarette butts and even the tobacco and the foil, and I, I brush rubber over that whole lot. So I make a one-piece mold, and then I turn it upside, upside down. I take all that stuff out. So I have a negative in this sort of pink rubber, which has a lot of static electricity. Then I take dry pigments, and I'm looking backwards. I'm working backwards, and I put in... I know that cigarettes have like a corky bum, and I know that um, maybe I'll make those wrappers pink, and maybe I'll put silver here. And um, I got the foil wrong. I made it gold instead of silver. And then I pour this casting medium into that lot. It grabs all the color. I unmold it and I kind of feel like Dr. Frankenstein in a funny way that I'm kind of making a golem or I'm making a, my own world. I'm going to make the world from scratch, start from scratch. There's obviously some sort of um, will to power going on in the studio. I mean the studio, the beauty of it is how much power I have there. I have lots and um, every year I with mold making, I didn't think I would do it for so long, but every year I feel more and more I've, I've got another way to use it. It will help me get closer in this other way. So it's gone on for a long, long time. Um, oh, what I was going to say, though, is when it came to um, material, the material world, uh, because I was working with it so, so diligently and, and, and in many ways not working with people, so I was forming relationships with these things and began to classify them into class um, systems and to be, begin to have feelings for these classes, like the servant class seemed so um, misused. So trays and ashtrays, ashtrays. I mean, someone should start a rescue, like a help the ashtray um, movement, because ashtrays, what's the point of making these beautiful glass things and then stuff, stubbing your cigarette in there? I just don't get it. So there's all these um, objects that have been put into service uh, for, to deliver you better things like cocktails and things like that. So these works are kind of after the cocktail is drunk and the, the servants are still there. There's a few of these in the exhibition down the... Just going to check the time here. I'm going to go a little faster. Um, and then they can stack up like this. And so um, in many works there's these animals that have also been kind of utilized. Animals um, are useful for me as a sculptor. Um, you know, when I'm talking about my relationship with the world and humans and things, I'm actually... Um, doing it as a sculptor, so I care about sculpture a lot, and I think about the, um, the principles of sculpture, the, the fact that, that, that they are also things that are sometimes coexistent with other things, and they uh, disappear a little bit more than a painting might disappear, because sometimes you can mistake a sculpture for a real thing, and that, that mistake between the real and the... Um, the uh, manufactured or the mistake between the real and the mimicry. Um, I like that gap because in that couple of seconds, perhaps, uh, when, the, when the person looking is trying to figure out is that real or not, um, I love that disconnection from knowledge and that disconnection from naming. Um, as I love it as a form of freedom um, in lots of ways. No, no, maybe not. I was going to say I could live that way all the time and have no connection between things and their names, but obviously that would be like a, a drug trip that never ends or that would be um, unpleasant. Um, but I think art is a place to entertain that, um, that thing. They, these works are always sculptures, but... Um, People will refer to the little creature, which is, what is it? It's a baby raccoon. No, it's a baby raccoon. Um, sometimes creatures that have fluffy fur, when I put the rubber on to make the mold, it flattens the fur down and they appear like other creatures, which they're related to those other creatures. So their fur is a, a kind of like a costume, which I'm getting to, actually. I'm getting to costumes. Um, so these are piles of these things that were... That, that were material that, that we wanted to bring in. I wanted to bring in. And then there's this sort of um, uh, exhaustion um, and, and also lack of satisfaction. Um, something I was going to say. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
in these class of objects, knowing that ashtrays and textiles and trays and um, packaging, um, boxes and shelves are this constant sustaining class of objects that serve very, very um, um, selflessly um, a rotating class of trite and trendy gigas that come and go. Um, there are also a class of um, objects that uh, know that we want to absorb the material world, and they and they let us they let us uh, uh, suck them in. So um, that's why I have so many cigarettes. I don't smoke. Don't worry, I don't smoke. Um, and I and I'm and I didn't quit smoking or something like that. So I just am um, sensitive to the fact that there are many substances that are in the material world that operate almost like other operate beyond the realm of objects. They have some sort of sensitivity to our desires and they come towards us and they join us and then they don't quit us. And so I have lots of... Uh, forget this one. I have lots of uh, images of um, these kinds of objects. So here, there's this is a sculpture. I call the jacket a sculpture um, that's serving... Um, to catch the ashes of something that's not a sculpture. The cigarette is a real thing. In almost all the, the works where I have a, a very realistic cast object, I, I include something that I, that I say is from the world. Um, so the cigarette is from the world. So they have this relationship. Obviously the, um, the cast objects in this case are fig figures or figurative. I say that's obvious, it might not be to you, but when I uh, arrange the jacket on the in the studio in order to make the mold. It takes a long time to arrange that jacket because I'm trying to put it into um, a, a state of mind or a state of body, let's say, that um, is expressive of of its need for the thing that I'm going to add. Like here, I've added a bottle of tequila to this jacket. So, so I want them to have a relationship. Um, this is a bottle of scotch in the neck. These are, are removable, these bottles. But the glove is not. The glove and the jacket are cast as one thing. Oh, this is where I was going to talk about costumes. Um, gradually, um, working in the studio for, for all these years has worked for me um, in the sense that I feel more, more better. I feel more better. Um, about um, uh, about uh, where I find myself, you know, in this changing, um, not knowable uh, world, um, I, f I feel that not knowing it is not so bad. I feel I don't have to grip it and hold it and hide it and just have it for myself. So, so whatever, um, I wouldn't use the word anxiety, I think that's maybe too strong. I maybe uh, think the word worry is more appropriate. And um, one time I looked up the uh, origin of the word worry and I thought it was so interesting to find that at the beginning uh, the word worry was used as a way to describe um, um, a, um, a lust and a almost uncontrollable desire to consume something um, through the mouth. And so it would be used, for example, um, to, to describe how a dog might chase a rabbit and grab the rabbit and then worry that rabbit. So the dog is so, um, doesn't even know why he's chasing the rabbit. It's so instinctual and so uncontrolled and so... Um, uh, intense, and then so when he grabs the rabbit, he's choking on the rabbit. So worry is that choking on something that you desire so much. So you desire it, and you take it, and then it you, it overwhelms you. And somehow, that word then left the body and became a word to describe grabbing a thought and not letting it rest, and you, and worrying a thought. So it's a worrying about the door, like it's better just to shut the door, don't think about it anymore, go away, it is closed, it is locked. But 
Your desire to have that door locked when you walk away is so intense that, that your desire for control and to know that door, you would like to actually be that door and feel the lock, that you worry it and you walk away and the, the door and the lock are still um, obliterating every other thing or thought you see. So, so um, I gradually found uh, uh, or became interested, let's say, in people's... Um, systems of ways that they could um, manage the distance that I'm talking about, that everybody feels. And one of them is to um, mess with your identity through various costumes or various, e even greater than that, maybe you um, move to another country and speak a language that isn't your first language. Um, I became very interested in these reenactors because they were very devoted to this childish... Um, play acting that um, is, is what I'm speaking of, is that sort of a floating of the imagination where you um, disregard the conventional <clears throat> truth and you create a whole new truth. So these guys who are, I met them in 2001, um, they are totally um, uh, Confederate uh, soldiers on leave on the weekends at these events. And it's simply through material. It's their costume. He's, this man searched very, very hard. That would be an antique Bible from the time. He would uh, also search for vintage glass and he would give it to the photographer. So he had his photograph taken on real vintage glass. So And, and then he sold them actually as antiques because if they were tested, the, materially they were the right vintage. Um, so this idea of, of manipulating material to this degree of control was really interesting to me. And uh, I became interested in the body. It was another way to get a little closer to looking at humans, but I'm still just really looking at what they're wearing. Uh, so there's a work down the hall that refers to that as well where I've just shown their torsos, and um, I covered it with a kind of uh, coal dust um, to, to, to kind of um, keep the photograph away, to keep the image away a bit. <clears throat> I also, I was going to say recently, but it's more like 10 years or, or more, um, uh, found that I could um, treat material well. <laughs> I could be nice to things. Um, and so I made some sculptures that I that I took care of. Um, I don't have a good image of this, but you can see he has a bandage. He has two bandages where his horn broke in the demolding process. And in that mold, the horn broke every time I demolded it. Always broke in the same place. So I thought that I, I couldn't have that image. I thought it was a failed work. And it was some time later, a, a good long time later, that I thought part of the sculpture is the um, return of the artist in a different role. Not the artist that's trying to pull an image out of the world, but an artist who is trying to comfort the image, comfort the image, and um, be tender towards the image. Uh, so, so some works have ensued from thinking of that, um, including uh, the, these works. I just call them the blanket works. There's about 12 works that are like this, um, based on wool blankets that I find at Value Village. Um, so they're not collectible, especially they're like the $5, $6 variety of blanket. Um, and I, I started by joining them together in this fashion. I was thinking these wool blankets are obsolete because they're too small, and um, they were usually kind of made for a single bed, and many people now live in giant, giant beds. Um, a king-size bed is a giant bed, and one of these wool blankets just looks like a towel on a king-size bed. So the first thing I wanted to do to treat them well and to help them um, was to join many of them together to make a king-size blanket. So the blanket works have all been cobbled together, I'll just see if I've got another one, cobbled together to make it king size, um, then they're cleaned and they're mended and they're dealt with, and they're then hung on the wall as though they, they have come back from the dry cleaner. So it's um, kind of a different relationship for me uh, with the sculpture. It also, in these works, I wanted to see if I could 
put the sculpture in a position where it was more disappearable or it could escape. It could, all of these blankets could be used on a bed. They're not, um, they're not phony in any way. They're not appearing like blankets. They could um, be blankets. Sometimes uh, when I'm making work, I think I don't want to make work that's about something. I want to make work that is something. And when I get confused, I use that as a difference. Um, it's also one reason I don't make work that refers to... I remember when I was teaching, it was a hideous um, period of teaching when all the students were making work that referred to minimalism. And they thought that if they did something um, that had a right angle or had a box shape, it was a reference to minimalism. The other thing I thought was so odd about that was that minimalism was, was determined to refer to nothing. It was determined to be something, and that was a radical experiment. So when artists started making work that referred to other work, I thought they've, lo they've lost the... Um, They've lost this radical experiment. They've lost the um, opportunity that that radical experiment gave them. And, and uh, they've returned to academia. They've returned to knowledge as the, um, as the basis of how they'll proceed, which um, in many ways I don't want to, to do. Oh, that was so good to say that just then because... I don't want to do that, but I can't help it. <laughs> I don't want to do that, but I can't help wanting to know um, information. So when I was doing the blankets, I couldn't help um, looking at their labels to help me know where they were made or something. It made a difference to me. So I thought, even though I wanted to live entirely in a phenomenological condition, it's that that's not adequate i don't it's adequate for short periods but not all the time so when i was doing the blankets i became interested in their labels as this but i would flip them over and try to diffuse them or mute them or devoice them this is a work that leads to some work that's that's down at the lynn gallery um i found this small coat and I treated it a certain way, um, and I showed it in a faculty exhibition at Emily Carr, but all the, the sleeves were both hanging down, and it was very um, morbid. It's true I, I'm interested in death, but it's not true that I am morbid. Um, so I, I uh, took it back to the studio, and one day I just pulled its hand up like this and, and had it point at itself, and suddenly it became animated in a way that was useful to me. And it became the, the source of all this new work that I call Being This. And in these works, um, these numbers of units that the sculpture can play with that will ostensibly identify um, the thing um, are confused beyond any sorting out. And even the finger that's trying to help, the hand that's trying to point and say, well, this is what it's about. It's often um, confused and contradictory. Um, so if I started making work in the early 70s because I didn't want to take the fork in the road that would take me to the, um, to the roles and the relationships and the, and the jobs and the ideas and the names that were expected of me. If I took that other fork that I didn't know where it was going to end up, and today it's ended up here with me um, being so grateful to Gershon, um, it could be that a lot has changed in 50 years, and now the choices are so um, manifold and huge that that becomes a, another problem. Uh, certainly there's way more choices. Even now I think I could have relationships with people because there's methods to keep them at arm's length. Um, you know, it used to be either you were alone or you were with some vibrating, intense person. <laughs> now they can be like in a small box or they can be there but not there. So good. Um, I'm serious, it's really good. <laughs> There's choices, that's what I mean, I'm serious. I'm serious. <laughs> There's choices, it's better for us all. I'm not mocking it. Um, this is a little bird that was a dead bird, but is no longer a dead bird because now it's a sculpture. So I just put the bird in the glove and made a mold of the two of them and then heavily packaged it. So in this case, the world is the um, wrapping 
And um, it sort of brings me back to stuff because by now we all know, I think we'll agree that stuff is, there's too much of it, but we still get a thrill by the discovery and the novelty of new things rolling our way. And um, we slow it down by wrapping them up for each other and then unwrapping them. And uh, so the wrapping again is doing that job that trays and ashtrays are doing. And um, uh, so this is the last work of, of this presentation because it's perfect, isn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's perfect because we have time for questions. That was great. That was like this long, fantastic poem about your work. And we do have time for questions. So we have two microphones. Just wave at us and we'll bring one to you. And you have to use the microphone, even if you think your voice projects really well. Um, I'm just wondering if you could say something about the title of the exhibition, about the, the word surrender. Surrender, um, surrender uh, uh, came quickly because it, there was an image that Adelina was looking at um, of one of those garment things from being this, and on the sweater or the shirt it just says surrender. And I liked the image, and then the word suddenly seemed like... Um, uh, a description of the process that I'm hoping I am undertaking myself, where I'm giving in and not controlling. So um, it's a good word. It's not. Um, it's what I want. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could say, or if you wanted to even say a little bit about, I don't know if you remember Cheeto Rock, which was in AGO. It was a piece by you. Uh, and it was one of my first introductions to your work. And I, I really, really loved it. And also, maybe any of your thoughts on art objects being collected now, like art as object, that mm. then has like kind of a service to collectors or a service to people or some kind of like, like what class are they or how mm -hmm. you feel about that? Um, that? That work that you're talking about is called Cheeto. It's a pile of rocks. Um, well, it's not a pile of rocks. It's a sculpture that looks like a pile of rocks that's hollow, like a turtle shell. And underneath there's all these cheesies, right? There's the real pile is cheesies and the fake pile, the hiding, the disguise is rocks. Um, so, you know, you're asking, are you asking about the art market, or are you asking about museums, or...? Of course, anything you want to say about that work, because I love... Oh, okay, okay. Just my own thoughts on it. Okay. Secondly, art as objects, if you have any comment on that. Like, how people buy and trade without sort of... Okay. Okay, so Cheeto... Cheeto was one of... Many works, and I think I didn't show any tonight, um, where uh, I was trying to make a sculpture that could be, um, uh, the sculpture was serving um, uh, to hide the real. And the sculpture then, because it's a sculpture, um, it does have status. Art has pretty high status. Um, that, it's interesting to ask questions about why it has such high status, um, whether that's a controlled thing, whether that's a manufactured thing, or whether it just is that not everything that's made, even by artists, not everything is art. There's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of bad art. Um, so it might be um, that, um, like I really, really believe in art, I really like to see art, I, I like looking at art. So if people collect it, that's good, that's really good, um, because they look after it. Um, uh, as an artist, I want to forget about it immediately, as soon as it's finished in the studio, and I move on to the next, because I'm using the making of the work to figure something out. I often make a little headway as I'm making that thing, and so then it, I don't need it so much. Um, it can go someplace else, and if there's somebody else who has a different relationship um, to objects and they want to collect them and look at them, that's a really good, um, that makes the world go round. 
Um, the art market is just fucked, and there's just no doubt about it, and there's nothing we can do about it. It's really not about art. It's about capitalism. It's not our problem. Um, or it's, we, don't, we don't have the solution. Is what I mean. It is our problem, but we don't have the solution. You could stop making work. That wouldn't change it. Um, could you make work that... Oh, capitalism is amazingly agile and... Um, amazingly adaptive, and it will buy things that don't want to be bought. Um, Tom and I were talking about that today with Tino Segal's work that tries hard not to be bought, but then is, is very buyable. And so it's really interesting, but that's not, I'm not, it's not my subject. Um, so things, I'm, I'm very uh, glad that people collect work because I love to go to museums and see things. So there they are, and they're well looked after by people, and I'm always grateful. It's hard to do. That's my answer to that. <laughs> I throw things out. <laughs> I have a bin at my studio, and I take things down, I cut and slash and bang them with hammers and break them and put them in the garbage. And, um, you know, you've got to keep the numbers down. <laughs> Is there anything else? It, it's a very old piece, but your piece you did for the Millennium, uh, it's an older piece from when you did the Millennium, uh, or it, it was in the Millennium uh, collection at the National Gallery, and it's the pillow inside of, or the uh, sleeping bag inside oh, oh, the, oh. the tree, and much like this young person here, that's a piece of yours that's always stayed with me, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. That one is called Hollow, and so it's the, um, I made a mold of a cedar tree. The cedar tree had maybe a diameter of about 36 inches. Cedar trees are really beautiful. They flare out at the bottom. It was a standing cedar tree, so I put the rubber up the tree. Strangely enough, that, that hollow piece and that mold was the first mold I ever made. And why would I start with such a big goddamn thing? You know, I put that rubber up like 12 feet high, and it got stuck. And why did I do that? I don't know. Why didn't I just do a small thing? So, um, so I took the mold off the tree. Um, the, the reason I did it turned out to be not what I did. When I got the mold to the studio and I tipped it down and it's lying on the floor, I saw that it was a tube. <laughs> Hadn't occurred to me that a tree is kind of a tube that's full of itself, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> And it didn't occur to me till I saw the mold lying in the studio. So then I thought, I'll make a shell. It wasn't my plan. That isn't why I made that big mold. I'll make a shell, and I'll make it into a tube. And if I close off one end, it's a, it's a cup. It's like a cup, right? And if it's big like this, um, it's a cup I can climb into. And um, so that relationship of the body to hiding places or places to be safe. Another way to get close to material is to inhabit it. A room is still material and you kind of, rooms are great because you're inside, then you're inside the object. It's pretty good. Um, so it kind of went like that, you know. I, and kind of maybe everything goes like that. I get an idea. I don't ask a lot of questions of myself. I don't vet it. I don't say, is this really worth it? Because it, I don't know if it is or isn't, first of all. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I don't know what I'm going to find out even at step number two of the process. Always something happens. Even when I know a lot now, things happen that I'm that I, um, are, I'm not expecting. And all of those things that I didn't plan, um, so I never call myself a conceptual artist. You know, I have ideas, but ideas are different from concepts, I guess. Um, <coughs> And my works never turn out the way I first envisioned them. I need a bit of a vision to get going, but I, then I just kind of go like, like a bird dog, you know. You know, bird dogs aren't very smart, but I'm just like a bird dog. <laughs> we have time for one last question. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was just wondering, what do you do with all the different versions of one bedroom apartment? Do you, with all, because you mentioned you kind of acquire things depending on where you exhibit it. Do you, do you make a two bedroom apartment? Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. 
<laughs> it just disappears back into the flow, into the stream. You know, that stuff is just gathered from people's houses. Sometimes the curator is moving, and so she says, oh, I'll, my bed, I'll store it in the gallery for two months. So the stuff is just gathered together by hook or by crook. When I did it at Susan's in the first uh, iteration, I was pretty strict about it, and I had a list. There had to be a toaster and an ironing board and a box of dishes, because I was interested in these uh, firms that rent out the contents of a one-bedroom apartment for someone who's coming to Toronto for a year to, to have a job, and they're just going to be there for a year. So I like that kind of immediate... Uh, it's like a costume. The house has a costume. So, no, the stuff just goes right back. I don't keep any of that stuff. I just take the dog home. <laughs> okay. And I'd like to welcome you at this point to, well, let's do that thing where we applaud Liz Megor. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Um, the work that Liz was just talking about is upstairs on view in the Lind Gallery. You're welcome to go and see the exhibition and join us all in Walker Court to celebrate Liz again, but with drinks. Thank you. I'll see you all down there. <laughs>